Welcome to the Honor It All podcast. I'm Honor Garrett, your host, and we're here to honor all that is good in the world. Each podcast, I interview top professionals around the globe who are making a difference, impacting lives, and creating positive change. Today, we have Justin Conico, one of the owners of Prime Real Estate Brokerage and Prime Media Productions. He is a real estate media and marketing expert along with being a dominant player in the real estate industry, Justin has used his experience to show others how to successfully scale their businesses. He is also one of the founders of the Industry Syndicate Podcasting Network, comprising 26 shows with a listenership cresting at 300K a month. Justin is no stranger to public speaking as he runs a weekly podcast titled Prime People Podcast. That's a tongue twister. (laughs) But what I think makes Justin so amazing is his ability to take all the things he does and approach business and relationships with a completely fresh perspective. I'm so honored to have you here today, Justin, as part of the Honor It All podcast. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you doing, Honor? I'm doing great. Life is good. So, um, and I really enjoyed um, seeing a live from you today. And I want to tell our listeners, I first met Justin on Clubhouse um, or discovered him in the Breakfast of Champions room. And every time I hear him speak, it just, it speaks to my soul. He's so inspiring and motivating. Um, And just by your desire to succeed and, and more importantly, you share your expertise so generously. So one thing I've heard you mention in the past is about the people that have helped you along the way and the connections that you've made. Could you speak um, to the importance of that personally? Yeah, hundred percent. And it's why I share, right? Like when I'm in those rooms and I'm saying the things that I'm saying, I try and stick to topics that I know, right? Which would be productivity, obviously sales and marketing through the lens of somebody that owns a real estate brokerage, uh, media and, and media production, because I do think that there's a big gap in the marketplace for people that own small businesses that need to create content, but don't have $10,000 to shoot a commercial every month. Um, and then execution, right? And I was at a stage in my life, I worked in customer service, running restaurants for years, right? So I, my mentor at the time owned one of the largest restaurant chains in the area and had a, a myriad of different companies. And I did every job in that company. Right. So I was in the service industry. I was a bouncer, DJ, barback manager. And then I was eventually the marketing coordinator manager for the entire company. So that was my education was marketing and advertising. But with a link to people, there was always people involved. It was, you know, we're going to brand this restaurant, this, and we need to shift here. And this place is struggling. What are the procedures we put in place? But it was all meaningless unless the people were on board with the plan. And my first mentor, Mike, was the one that really taught me how that servant leadership mentality put him in a position that he was able to gain the loyalty of the people that were with him and execute things that a lot of other companies would have a hard time executing because they didn't have that loyalty piece. Right. So Mike was the very first guy that really let me run his companies as if I owned them. So I got a, you know, MBA level education in my mind of running a business, understanding costing structure, hiring, firing, implementation, execution, marketing, branding. And then I got into the real estate industry my wife threw me off a cliff. I didn't want to do it. Actually. She was like, let's, let's open a business. We actually almost bought two franchises um, in the food service industry. We were very, very close. We had meetings with corporate. It was perfect. My wife's a genius MBA level education from Ivy. She's the CEO. I'm the marketing and advertising and, and boots on the ground guy. So It was perfect fit. And just something didn't feel right about it. And she mentioned real estate. And my exact response was, well, I don't want to be a grease ball on a golf course. They don't work hard. I work hard. And that was my perception. Um, And then I got in the industry and it goes to exactly what you asked me. I started looking at who is doing things that I respect in the industry that I could learn from. Right. And I met another one of my mentors, Ryan Surhand, fairly early on into my career through proximity to another friend of mine. So we talk about how did people lead to you growing? It was my buddy, Jazz Takar saying, Hey, you need to meet this guy, Ryan. While Ryan was very early on in his career and He had some roots in Soho and he had the TV show, but he didn't have the image and size that he had now. And me getting proximity to a guy like Ryan, you know, trying to serve him and his team and give them information about systems and processes and some stuff that I was doing that maybe they weren't. And then him turning around and saying, or seeing something in me that maybe he saw in himself early on and just 
sharing stuff with me to no direct benefit of his own at that time. Right. And then that led to me and my wife really shifting our business and growing and leveling up much faster than we ever thought possible. And other relationships where every time I would meet somebody like him or Mike or Mm -hmm. other mentors I've had, once you show them that you're willing to implement and you're hungry and you don't want anything from them, you're just genuinely curious, it tends to open a lot of doors. So to answer your question, it is the reason why I am where I am today is other people. And it's also the reason why I openly share everything about what we do is it makes me work the ideas out, but it's also to honor, no pun intended, the people that came (laughs) before me. (laughs) Well, it, it, it reminds me, have you read the book, the go-giver? I have very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I love that whole premise of you just never even know who you're talking to or who they might know. And it's not about what you can get from them, but if you really authentically engage in them and want to know about them and want to learn a from them. And you should be that way with every, I want to say everyone, you still have to, they have to earn your, you know, no like, and trust, but I'm always curious about everybody. I, I just think that we can really learn something from everybody. So that reminded me of that book, but can you tell our listeners, I, you seem so driven. So, I mean, have, and, and it seems like you have so many projects because you're, you do this and this, and you own this, you know, How have you managed to accomplish all of this? So I would say perception is, you know, not always what it seems when it comes to what you see on social media and in the public, right? Yes, I have a lot of things on the go, but one of the biggest challenges I've had is really telling that narrative that I'm available, right? Because a lot of times people would think I won't have time to do something like this, or I can't pick up my phone or, you know, Mm -hmm. how could this guy possibly sell my house when he's doing all of these other things yet? you know, try me 519-860-6547. That's my cell number. Call me. I'll I'll likely, because I'm doing this, say, Hey, I'll get back to you shortly, but you will get a response and I will call you back. The answer to your question is infrastructure and planning, right? So having leverage in people and systems is how I'm able to manage so much. And I, I don't need to control everything, right? I don't need to be a creative director and an editor and, you know, do color grading. And I don't need to hit the send button on my newsletter. I don't need to make sure that I look at every single line of everything that goes out because in my world and in the world we live in today, speed of implementation and execution is everything. And then radical transparency to look back at the work that you're doing and seeing, does it map to a level of excellence you're trying to achieve and not being afraid to cut things down is how I've been able to do it with my wife, where we'll try a hundred things, probably Mm -hmm. cut out 75 of them, but then the 25 that we keep, they're ironclad. And then we move on to the next and we'll try another hundred and then we'll chop out 75 and then always keep stacking that 25, um, but being very fast in doing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, and it's really important, like you said, to kind of let some of that control go. I think that that's what most entrepreneurs probably have is feel like it's all on their shoulders um, and I've, I've heard you speak before, um, about time blocking because, you know, we all have the same 24 hours in the day and some people get a whole lot more done than others. <laughs> so is, is time blocking something that you use a lot, even just for your personal life? Yeah. So a book recommendation that I'd say to most people should read is called atomic habits, right? And it just talks about the habit stacking principle, So I'll walk you through a simple day in my life where people are like, how do you do so much? Well, it it is habit stacking, right? So if I, I wake up now around 445, sometimes 430, try to be a breakfast with champion for five, but I like to do about a half an hour of prayer and journaling before that. I don't want to touch my phone right away. So try and wake up a little bit earlier. And I have an infrared sauna because I have a a bit of a hip issue and some health issues and infrared saunas are really good. So I wake up, turn on my infrared sauna, grab my Bible, go in there first, right? So I've already accomplished in the very beginning of my day, not touching my phone. I've done some thoughtfulness. So I've activated my brain. I've done a little bit of journaling. So I have a little bit of intentionality. And then I 
jump into breakfast with champions, go upstairs, grab my water, grab my vitamins. If I'm going to train, maybe I'll grab a pre-workout five to seven. I'm usually moving, right? I think it's important to not touch the phone when you wake up. I think it's important to be present and mindful, whatever that means to you. I think it's important to move next before you start checking your emails and dealing with all of the things of the day. So the first call it two hours of my day, there's a lot of intentionality to getting the machine going. Now, when I'm in breakfast with champions, sometimes the conversation is so good that I do jump in and I start talking in between five and seven. I'm normally pretty quiet at that time because I'm training or working out, but I also have a little bit in me where, you know, I'm ideating as I'm working out. I tend to think when I do it. So I have a notebook open, my squat racks behind me. This is my (laughs) office slash gym. So as I'm working out, maybe in my rest pauses, I'm just brain dumping little things that I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to do that today. Or, you know, this is a cool idea or something I hear in Breakfast with Champions. I write it down in my notebook, right? So I keep a physical notebook. I think that's important for people tactically to write things out. And it's a good way to learn. And for me, it's just a great outlet. Then seven o'clock comes. And this is where it really kicks in. So 7 to 7.30, I'm in a clubhouse room called Good Morning Real Estate. So I leave Breakfast with the Champions. I go to Good Morning Real Estate. I was one of the original members of that room. And it's probably one of the larger real estate rooms where we just go over, what are you sipping on? What are you grateful for? Any challenges, right? Just a very simple three questions. And we round table. And a lot of times we have some pretty high level discussions about like, you know, what's happening in the market strategies. And I learn a lot in that room, but I've synced that room up with, the time that I do my mind sweep and my time blocking. So exactly what you asked. Mm -hmm. So everything that I've brain dumped on paper, what I then do is I dump it into my external brain. So the external brain concept is a point of leverage, right? It is a tool that helps me store all of the things, personal, professional, everything. Mm -hmm. And for people that haven't ever used an external brain, I'd recommend Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O. It's free. It's a very simple app. You can create cards and columns. Let's just talk about the columns. My columns, if I pull them up here and take a look at them, goals today, urgent this week. I have a a list that's called balls up. That's a Sirhan concept of like, I tossed a ball up the air and I'm waiting to catch it. Right. So it's, you know, I've set my information to honor. I'm waiting for her to email right. me back. That's a you made up. the first move. You're waiting. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then two sorts. That's it. Those are those are the main lists. Goals today is just in my face every day. Wake up at five. Now it's four thirty. Don't touch the phone. Write down gratitude and goals. So on and so forth. Right. So my goals are just visually there. I never even have to touch the column, but I see it always in proximity. Then my urgent list is never more than six to eight things, urgent things I have to get done. If you can do six things a day, you will move mountains, six major things. Then this week balls up into sort. Now the key is every night before I look at this list and I I move it around. So I'll go through my urgent list and I'll be like, oh, Blair Monteris, that's actually done. Nathan's taking care of that right now. Okay, I can archive that. Oh, YouTube guy, drop that yesterday, done. Jason Grogan, Alicia, oh, you know what? I'm waiting for a response from them. I'm going to move that to the balls up column. Chris, you know what? Balls up, already dealt with that. Jim, you know what? I don't have to do that today. I can do that this week. Or I don't have to do that at all. I'm going to put that in the two sort column. Like I'll get back to it one day. So the real key concept with the external brain is, 15 minutes at night, 15 minutes in the morning. If you can keep a regular cadence of that, Mm. you can already see how your productivity exponentially increases because your willpower isn't being drained, managing all the things in your day. Oh, I got to get back to that person. I got to do this. I got to do that. Right. And that's, that's a real thing. Then when I said mind sweeping and time blocking, once I have my core six and the things I want to accomplish, I open up my calendar. So I take the things that I want to do and I physically put them on my calendar. And if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. (laughs) That's how I just have to live my life at this point. Right. And the last piece of that, when I'm looking at my calendar, the concept of the calendar is I treat it like Tetris. So I've got all of the things here. Mm -hmm. I think I've done most of them. There's one I didn't do. Actually, I looked at it now. It's time block for 915. I'm not pressed about it. After we're done our call, I'm going to call these people. I'm just going to pick up the phone and I see it there. So it's like almost a second checklist as well as it is a calendar. And if I don't do these things today, I can look at my calendar and be like, is this actually important or should I do this tomorrow? Right? So your calendar now becomes a supercharged 
assistant to help you organize what you have to do. I'm actually going to go to the beach after this. I'm not going to call those people because I promised my daughter I would, <laughs> but you know, I, I've got some perspective now on what do I have to accomplish? When am I going to accomplish it? Does it, is it actually humanly possible in my calendar? And then the last piece that I would layer and, and tell your audience to do is create separate calendars for the different things in your life, right? Your faith, your family, your finances, and your fitness. F simple as that. Mm -hmm. You know, for myself, it's my work calendar is blue. My family calendar is yellow. My personal Justin calendar is green. I've got different calendars that I can turn on and off depending on what I, I want my overall calendar to look like. And the superpower with that, and I'll wrap this point up with this, is you'll get perspective of how much are you pouring into your work, your mm -hmm. family, your faith, your finances, and your fitness. And if my calendar is nothing but blue, my wife and my daughter aren't going to have a good relationship with me. So I always have to look at, you know, how colorful is my, oh, sorry, I just dropped off. That's okay. One I second. can hear you. Yeah. I was just going to say, I can see how much I'm actually putting into the work that I'm doing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I was going to ask you actually about, do you turn everything off at one point and go, okay, now it's time for family. Let me switch my camera and I will answer that question. Yeah, sure. Take your time. You guys are going to get the behind the scenes. <laughs> so you're going to see my entire gym. And three, well, two, this is one. I, it, behind me is my living room, but it's still fake because that's awesome. Um, I'm in a different part of the house. <laughs> well, here's, right, here's my squat rack that I was talking about. So you're definitely right. seeing a little bit behind the scenes um, to answer your question. Yes. And it's time blocked. So uh, Sundays are screen free Sundays. So I actually try and not touch any screen device, no TVs, no iPhones, no computers, no tablets, no nothing. Screen free Sundays is a concept I learned years ago. And it's been wonderful because you get that dopamine reset, which is a real mm -hmm. thing. Um, you know, I try every night to have dinner and be here present, you know, six to eight o'clock, but we're going away in a little bit and I'm going to have to work late over the next little bit to make time for that time we're going away. So it allows me to kind of do that. But in my calendar right now, it says 5.30 to 7 p.m. Family dinner time. Enough time right. to cook food, talk to my wife, connect with my daughter, sit down, eat. And then, you know, I'm going to probably have to do a little bit of work tonight. So, you know, I'll make a little bit of time for here and there. And then phone calls, again, unless it's urgent, because I will take calls from my clients if we have a deal on the go. And I have one right now that we're probably going to be a later night negotiation. Okay. It is what it is, but I'd say 90% of the time I try and just turn the phone off and leave it here after about 8 PM, because I think we have a bad tendency in this world of thinking we need to be available 24 seven when truthfully, a lot of business can wait until the morning. That's, that's so true. I, I, sometimes we think we're so much more needed than we actually are, but, um, as, as a health and life and mindset coach, I mean, I believe a hundred percent, um, that in order to be successful, you have to have your health. You have to have good health because without it, you either won't get there or if you do succeed, you won't be able to enjoy it. <laughs> so what are your thoughts about health and fitness? And I heard you talk a little bit about dinner. Um, are you a cook? Do you eat healthy? I surprisingly love cooking. Um, never did before. So I was a bit of a, a party boy in my previous life. And it's funny. I've shared this in the room. I don't know if you've heard this before, but I, I dealt with addiction issues when I was younger and I've been sober for almost 15 years now. One of the ways that really helped me was developing a healthy relationship with food and actually making food. So I still remember it was the Gordon Ramsay healthy appetite book that I got the first cookbook. Um, I made a minestrone soup for my wife. She loved it. And I was like, I can make minestrone soup. And it was pretty simple. It was just the tomatoes yeah. and the stock and everything else too, but it was real food. And I really started enjoying the process of going to grocery stores and picking fresh produce and turning that into a recipe. Um, now I, I'm probably a lot more mechanical about it than anything else. So I'll have like my core food and I'll be making dinner on a fairly regular basis, but I, I do think it's important to eat real food and cognitively makes all the difference in the world. So yeah. far from perfect, but I am very conscious about what I try to ingest. Absolutely. Um, I, I believe the food aspect affects our brain directly. Um, especially me, I'm getting older, 55 years old. You can tell that you're not as cognitively there all the time. So, um, I have to be very mindful. Well, put it uh, this way, right last night. So 
I say that, you know, I'm not always perfect. My issue that I'm really trying to deal with is late night, late night snacking, right? After 8 p.m., I know it's not good for me because I'm typically going to bed at 10, but I burn so much energy through the daytime. <laughs> I, high energy, obviously I am. At That's nighttime good. comes, I'm like, oh, look, I'll, I'll an entire box of croissants. I'm going to eat like six of them, right? And then you'll do that and then you'll wake up and you'll be literally, it's a brain fog. Like I can right. see it so, so clearly when I'm eating well versus when I'm not eating well. Yeah how different my brain function is, my energy level, my attitude, how nice I am and pleasant to be around. Like you will notice drastic shifts in your personality depending on what you're eating. Is, is your um, wife into fitness as well? She is. Yeah. I mean, we're very active, right? We yeah. live in a little beach town and, you know, like I said, we're going to go to the beach after this too. So we try to stay very active. Yeah. Um, but a very, I think, whole food approach to our diet. We don't, we're not very restrictive, but we try and at least know that we're getting clean food and what it is and where it's coming from. That's awesome. Well, um, I wanted to touch on a couple of things. Uh, so my husband is a football coach. He has been since we, well, he used to play, but since we've been married, he's been a football coach. And honestly, leading a team is literally so natural for him. It is, it's his genius. So what would you say your genius is? I think finding the, the best in other people, right. And pulling it out of them. Like I can usually see things in people that they can't see in themselves and drag it out of them. Probably because I'm just very direct in the way that I communicate with them. And I just try and be a mirror. Um, I'm very big on not trying to ever leave by telling somebody they need to be me. Right. It's usually seeing something you're passionate about. My wheels are already spinning, right? You, what you're trying to accomplish with this podcast, maybe your husband, the world that you're in. And well, okay, who do I know that might be able to connect you and, and help you succeed in your goals? Or, you know, how can I serve you so that you feel like, okay, he's watching now and I got to do this, right? I think that's my biggest thing is being, being able to bring out more in people than they see in themselves. Now that's beautiful. And, and honestly, that's what it's all about is relationships back to what we started with. Um, everybody just helping and encouraging and mentoring each other. And that's, what's so important. Um, sometimes we learn the most from our biggest failures. I like to call them growth. <laughs> <laughs> what has been your hardest, but most gratifying lesson in life? I, I do think it was overcoming addiction without a doubt too. Right. And it, it's pretty simple. Like I did feel like during that time I was living for the recognition of other people. Right. And I was reading scripture this morning and it was talking about how essentially if you're living for the world, you're never going to be satisfied. Right. Because you're chasing the acknowledgement of somebody else. You know, I've, mm -hmm. you got the million subscribers on YouTube, you got the car, you got the watch, you got this, you got that. Well, okay. Once you get it, lasts about a week. And then you're like, well, that guy's got a bigger boat or that guy's got a bigger house. Or it's, it is an empty hole, but you know, going back to what you're saying, the service aspect of living for something bigger than yourself is really where the difference maker is. Right. And I found that that world, the people that I was attracting in the lifestyle that I was in was one that was very destructive and very much like, what have you done for me lately? Fair weather friends and just not conducive to a better ecosystem or community. So when I broke free of that, I got some perspective that I was inherently beautifully and wonderfully made. Like it wasn't about what I could do. And again, I keep going back to my faith because it is integral to where I come from. But I think there's a big misconception about my faith where people think that you know, well, you have to be this or we're going to judge you because of it. When in fact, it was the opposite, right? I was probably one of the most broken people you've ever met, yet I still had inherent value, right? And if that meant that I could work towards something that was bigger than myself and leave a legacy behind me, well, then everybody else was in a better starting position than me because they're probably a better person than me, right? So if I'm as flawed as I am as a human, able to just wake up every day and be inspired and motivated and driven, then I, I just want to impart that to everybody else and let them know that they're beautifully and wonderfully made and they have inherent value in whatever their genius zone is and to go and find it. And I think I had to see that darkness, right? I almost died twice mm -hmm. from an opioid wow. addiction. And I was just like, that's, I've seen what that's like. So I can see people that are, are stuck in that life and tell them there's another life that's out there for them. They just, they have to believe it. Well, this might be personal, but you can tell me if you want to answer it or not. But 
Um, I, obviously your faith is important to you as it is to me as well. Um, did you find your faith, um, in the Lord when, when you were going through the addiction or did someone help you and, um, or did, did you always have it? Like where, where did you grow up in it? Yeah. So I, I fully remember with a breakthrough without a doubt. And I was always, I always believed that there was a God and I was always like this, there's no way that there's just random occurrence and that <laughs> everything just, there's too much design behind it. Right. I'm not, I won't get into a debate around yeah. what that looks like, but to me, I just, I always had a relationship with God. I fell off really hard in my teens because again, chasing the world. Right. And I went down that path and I was given an opportunity once. And I felt like God was like, okay, which way are you going to go? And I made a decision to, to try and clean up my life at that time, but I fell back into the old pattern. Right. And I hit rock bottom at one point and it was like, are you done yet? Right. Like I literally felt like I remember sitting in my room back home and just on my knees weeping and being like, if, if you're there, like, tell me you're there. Cause it just felt hopeless. Right. And I got a very clear response from him and I was like, Oh, okay. And I, I just felt like, I got a response. Right. And then I, right. I went down that route, ra- that route. And I tried to go down the path of becoming the man that he had meant me to be. I heard somebody say once the definition of hell is dying and seeing who you could have been. Right. Or God saying like, this is what I had for you. Right. You still have to make the choice. You are the one that has to activate it, mm-hmm. but this is what I made you to be. Right. And I found that I, I got clarity of purpose, but then I, I fell back into the world again. So it's not like there's, it's a one shot solution <laughs> and I'm perfect. It's fell a back. process continually. Right. <laughs> it, it is. And I think, you know, I grew up Catholic and I grew up going to a church where in our, I think from Catholicism's perspective, a lot of times it's like, Hey, you got to go to this guy, then talk to this guy, then talk to this guy. Um, we happened to have a, a priest at the time who was very much like, no, no, you can talk directly to God, like just going to prayer and, and do that. And that was a glimmer that kind of left me to awesome. the relationship that I have with my wife. And that was the very interesting part. So when I met my wife, I met her mother and her mother is a warrior for God. Um, they operate a business in Southwestern Ontario, but they like her fingerprints are all over the globe with some of the stuff she does. And you would never know it. And I was really able to bounce things off of her, right? Like really challenging questions about difficult things that happen in the world and how does God let this happen? And what does this mean? And what does this mean? And I got just a lot, pretty much the same answer from her every time. Like, why don't you ask him, right? Like in in an indirect way. So as I developed my relationship with God, I had a couple of things happen to me from that period on that just shook me to my core that made, made it it's as real to me as it is if, if I walked outside and met my, my neighbor. Right. That's and awesome. I, I said, Hey, I know this guy because I hadn't the experience of meeting him and having a conversation. That's how I can be so convicted in my faith and turn around to somebody that maybe would mock me because of my faith and be like, you believe what you want. I know, I know what I know. Right. And that, right. that was the breakthrough was that relationship development that led me there. And I always tell people, I mean, once you know something, it could be about your faith. It could be about anything else. It could be about something, you know, that's going on in the world today. Once you know something, you can't go back. Like you can't unknow it. Um, but there are people in our audience that are struggling right now, I'm sure, because of their circumstances. Maybe they want to grow their business. Maybe, you know, maybe they're just stuck in fear or, or paralysis. Do you have any encouragement that you might share with, with someone? Yeah, it, it's a it's a long road, right? I think people are, think if they're not getting immediate results that nothing's happening. But you're from health and fitness, you know it's innocuous, right? It's it's me saying no to the croissants last night, and then maybe saying no to the pizza tonight at eight o'clock, and then maybe I eat a pizza the day after. But hey, I got two out of seven days, and then I'm going to work at three next week. It's it's what I say in breakfast with champions all the time. It's not a hundred percent one day. It's one percent a day forever. Um, and then you'll look back and you'll be like, how did I get here? And, and I feel imposter syndrome all the time where I'm like, well, I'm, I don't really have any business giving advice. I'll tell you my experience, but ultimately you're the one that has to really formulate what your perfect life looks like and do the work and, and be, here's the biggest tip, be radically honest with yourself. Right. I think we paint a picture. That's hard. Want to be. It's very hard. Right. <laughs> but nobody's the bigger critic of myself than me. And I'm okay with me. Like when the lights are off and the music's mm-hmm. off, I- I'm okay with that. So I think you got to start with loving yourself first and then getting a clear, clear idea of what you want to accomplish. And then the actions associated with those things. And, and I have to say, 
I think a lot of that for me has come with age. Mm -hmm. Like now that I'm older and I've experienced so much, I don't have the same insecurities that I did when I was in thirties or forties or twenties, because you just realize that it's it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. We're, we're still kids, right? I think people have a, a problem looking at, you know, they look at children and they're like, oh, they're, they're just little kids, right? You know, five, five to 10 year olds. Then the kids turn into teenagers and they're going through their first relationship and it shakes them to their core. And we're, we're laughing and be like, oh, I remember those days, right? But at, the kids at that age think, well, I, I'm all grown up, right? They think that they're adults. <laughs> and then when we were like 20 to 30, we thought we were adults. And as we go through phases in life, you know, I always think, I bet you the 90 year olds look at us and they're like, oh, those kids, like they'll know one day. Right. And ultimately the big man upstairs is going to say the same thing to us. You know, it's for all your struggles and all your toils. Did, yeah. did it matter at the end of the day? Right. So the question is, who do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> I want to be exactly who God made me to be I, nobody else. I don't want to be famous. I don't, I don't need anything. Okay. I, I, I keep saying, you know, I, I had a couple of near death experiences. I had one two weeks ago. I drank battery acid by accident. Um, a battery ended up in my Blendtec blender, got pulverized. I literally ended up in the hospital. And I, I, when I did it, I Googled oh it and I'm like, what happens when you do this? Cause that's what everybody says, right? You Google it. It's like, you die. And I was like, I remember looking at my wife and I'm like, this is it. Like I'm done. Right. And by the grace of God, I made it through and I'm okay. The, the doctors and the ambulance driver was like, what? They were super confused, but I, I still remember being at peace with it. Like it would have been sad for sure for my daughter and my wife, but mm -hmm. I was at peace with it. If, if that was it, if that's all I had. Right. So if I you want be... some advice about like, um, detoxing, you might need to do some detoxing though. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing <laughs> quite a, quite a bit of things I've had to do over the last little bit. Right. But uh, maybe but running restaurants for 10 years made me more immune than most people to something like <laughs> probably um well how do people find you like if someone wants to contact you because they're interested in either working with you or they want to have you come speak um i know you have amazing youtube videos um and you offer so much value so anybody watching this go subscribe to um to his youtube um video justin says great stuff and and a lot of value what what would you say is the best way though, to get in touch with you. It's all there. So just my name, Justin Conoco, mm -hmm. excuse me on YouTube or justinconoco.com. That's everywhere. You can go to Instagram. You can DM me. I'm the one who actually responds. Um, I'm on all the platforms. YouTube is really where I break down concepts in longer form. Justinconoco.com is where I offer free resources. Like we just dropped a PDF on how to get started on YouTube, right? Giving people just a little bit of motivation there. And there's actually two PDFs there, one about productivity and time blocking, what we spoke about. And there's another one about content creation. So creating batch content for Instagram and all the other platforms. Yeah, I already signed up. I'm there you go. <laughs> you should <laughs> so get there the, shortly. I checked it out. Awesome. Um, so is um, two more questions. Is there anything on the horizon? You're always encouraging others, but is there a big vision that you have for your future? Yeah, I think the vision that we're working on is really scaling people, right? I, I always get asked that question, like, what are you trying to accomplish? And again, I'm trying to systemize a platform that anybody can plug themselves into mm -hmm. and really helps find that best self that they have and helps lift them up into their genius zone, their execution in the real estate world. That, that could mean a global real mm -hmm. estate platform that you know, is just a very trusted name and is different than anything else in the industry. And from the production studio standpoint, same thing. Like we don't advertise. You can't just call us to work with us. It's usually by proximity and referral, mm -hmm. right? But we're, we're really trying to find ways to have massive impact using very surprising people. So that's it. It's just connecting that's with great. good people and yeah, building community. And what's so wonderful is that you and your wife are a team and can work together. Because a lot of husbands and wives <laughs> wouldn't yeah. do so well working together. So I think that's beautiful. Um, so Justin, I love to end each podcast with the same question for every single guest. This podcast is called the Honor It All podcast. So what are you choosing to honor today? I will honor your time and your audience's time. I think a lot of time, a lot of times people look at content as, you know, I'm putting this out, I'm putting this out, I'm putting this out. I like to think of, you know, people that have invested enough time to get to this point in the episode. I, I appreciate every single one of them. So if there's a way that I can serve them, I would love to know and obviously help you grow your platform. 
Well, I, I really appreciate it. And I was so excited um, that you were going to be on today. Um, and I just enjoy getting to know you better. So perfect way to end this episode with Justin Conoco. So thank you, Justin. I really appreciate it. I appreciate and, you as well. Keep growing yeah. the podcast. I'm excited for you. Thanks. And until next time, remember, we are not promised tomorrow. So be present today. That is the gift. And remember to take time to honor it all. And don't drink batteries. <laughs> yeah. Good advice.